Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him, let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine. Preserve what your right hand has planted. The word of the Lord. The reading is from Psalm 18. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, 
and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them turn to the Lord and he will have compassion. And to our God, for he will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as rain and snow fall into the heavens, and return not again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and gro giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but it will accomplish that which I have proposed and prosper in that for which I sent it. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who, placed, who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug some wine, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to his tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his, his parable, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You ever been in a church gathering or a group of friends and somebody says, would anybody like to pray or bless the food? What normally happens? Usually get some silence, crickets, if clergy is there, sometimes they'll say, okay, I'll pray. It happens in clergy groups too. There's an awkward silence, and then somebody finally says, I'll pray. And it's interesting, really, that relationship with prayer that sometimes exists within our tradition. It's like we're reluctant to pray. Have you ever been, maybe in another context, uh, different tradition perhaps, and you hear somebody pray, and it's like Jesus is going to come right in the door, wash everybody's feet, and just, just swoop us all up into heaven. Bishop Curry does pray like that. Well, that is an incredible prayer. There's something about that prayer, prayers like that, that are just recklessly insistent that God is listening. 
and God will fulfill that prayer. There's a kind of certainty that exists beyond all reason or good sense that drives prayers like that. And you know what I mean? And not always, of course, but very often, those kinds of prayers are rooted in sorrow and pain. Um, they often come from cultures and traditions that deeply know tragedy, deeply know oppression and mourning, and are intimately related to unreasonable hope. When I was in Richmond, we had a ministry called Laundry Love. We went into um, an under-resourced neighborhood and we would sponsor free laundry for about three hours on a Saturday, once a month. And uh, we did this for a few months. So anybody who came in, you got free laundry. And one day a woman came and she said, can we pray? And I had not thought about praying even in this context. And I said, yes, absolutely. And um, so I started thinking about something meaningful to say, and she began to gather people around us. She didn't know anybody there really, um, but she gathered about the 30, 35 people uh, together in the center of that laundromat. And I'm thinking about something meaningful to say, and she just started praying. And let me tell you, it was like rolling thunder before the rain. I mean, it. I had been thinking about something meaningful to say, but she just opened her heart and poured out everything that was in it. Pains, sorrows, hopes, praise of God, filled that place like a pinata. And when she yelled, amen, we all did too. And that pinata broke open and the candy of the Lord just spread everywhere. It was awesome. And there was that same insistence and God is listening and God will fulfill this prayer somehow. So here we are six months into a pandemic, the adrenaline is worn off. Pandemic fatigue is here. Millions of people have been infected with the virus. Over 200,000 people have died. The country is shedding itself. The economy is collapsing. School is at home. Parents are now teachers. We have a bitter election looming that will almost certainly be contested with violence waiting in the wings, slowly edging itself on stage. That's just some of the external stuff. And as humans, we're absorbing all of those negative data points and stimuli around us and anxiety depression and stress they're they feel like regular guests at the dinner table for a lot of us and I, have you ever just wanted to say why why is this happening and so we as a nation and as a church it feels like we're in uncharted territory there's uncertainty everywhere. 46% of people, according to the Pew Research Center, have uh, lost jobs or taken a pay cut, 46% of households, and almost 40% have struggled to make rent or mortgages. So if, if we didn't know before, we do now that we need God and we need God to listen. But lest, lest we think we're treading on new territory, we have scripture to remind us of our ancient tradition and that nothing is new under the sun. The psalm today begins like this. Restore us, O God. Show us your countenance and we shall be saved. So it's beautiful. First, it's demanding. Restore us. Show us your face. And then it says, we shall be saved. This insistent belief. If we just see your face, see a sign of you, we will be saved. You have brought us out of Egypt. You have prepared the ground for, for this 
house of Israel, the mountains were covered by its shadow. You stretched its tendrils to the sea, the psalm says. They're talking directly to God here. This is what you have done. Past tense. This is not what's happening now. But they're saying, God, you have given us this. But why have you broken down its wall? The wild boar of the forest ravages, ravages it. The beasts of the field have grazed all over this vineyard that God has planted, the vineyard being the people of Israel. It conjures up something like the broken, dilapidated houses I pass in the Shenandoah Valley, where you know no one's been there for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And nature, God's creation, has just slowly overtaken this thing. Uh, it is not what it used to be. And why? cries the psalmist. Why have you let this happen? Witness the despair of the people Israel. When I worked in New Orleans, rebuilding houses, I worked for a woman once who lived in a neighborhood that had gotten a lot of flooding at 10 to 12 feet of water. And they, she lived near a levee that levee had broke, so everything in the canal came into the neighborhood. She had three feet of mud, silt, and sand everywhere. <clears throat> that killed all of the trees, that killed the shrubs, killed all the grass. Nothing was living in this neighborhood. And she was the first person to move back. She lived in a FEMA trailer for years. But for weeks after she moved in, she said, all she smelled was death. And she prayed fervently every day, God, please show me something living. Give me something living. Give me a sign that I made the right decision to come back to New Orleans. And she was alone. She was the only living thing in this entire neighborhood. Please, God, give me a sign. Give me something. And one day, a little green weed popped out from that mud. And she said she saw that weed and ran inside and grabbed a watering can. She started watering that weed. She sang to it. She prayed over it. She gave it a name. It was like her Tom Hanks and, and uh, Wilson and Castaway. She just, I mean, that was, that was her sign. That was God's answer. And it wasn't a great, beautiful bush or a flower. It was a weed, but it was a living thing. And she never gave up hope that God was listening. The psalmist today never falters in their belief in the power of God. You see, they trust that God will in the end finish what God has started. This trust between God and the people of Israel, between us and God, is built into that relationship. It's as though they know they can't do anything for themselves. You have given us this. You have taken us this far, they say. God was the one that brought them out of Egypt. God gave the growth and abundance. And they understand that they are the work of God. Their existence is as a people, as a congregation, is the work only of God. And we, here as a church, we as a people, not as an act of God, but as the continuing act of God. And our world might be on fire, but God will finish what God started because we are what God started. And God is not finished with us yet. Restore us, O God of hosts. The psalm today ends with a demanding prayer. Turn now, O God, and look down from heaven. Behold, tend this vine. See us, God. Tend us. Preserve what you have planted. God wants your deepest prayers because you are an act of God. Your prayers, your sorrows, your joy, your lament... These are God's 
sorrows and joys and laments. That inclination to pray deep within you, that very movement in your heart towards God is the divine within you turning towards itself. You are an act of God. Let that life and let that act be a prayer. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires Incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness while it was day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, for the honor of your name. Amen. Today's prayers for the people are Psalm 3. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. 
Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for all those involved in mission, especially our sister parish in London, St. Acton's, St. Martin's Acton, our companion parish in Honduras, San Lucas, St. Mary's Sakangi and St. Andrew's in Debwe, Tanzania, the Episcopal Church of the Sudan and South Sudan for peace in the world. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and for Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, our bishops. We pray for all who are lonely and suffering during the pandemic. We pray for all students, teachers, and parents. We pray for Siren Dowsett, Nathan Brooks, Dan Donahue, Norris Keeler, Elspeth Delabar, Kevin Bayreuther, and Jim Cook. For those traveling, for those who called to work and serve overseas, for those killed or wounded, and their families, for those taken hostage, and for all those targeted for violence throughout the world, especially all those persecuted for their faith. We pray for those who have died, especially parishioner Nata Hassel. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. 
We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence upon you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our petitions and desires as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.